welcome you to day two of Back from the Brink Innovations Conference. I'm Van der Foyt and I work for Natural England and it's my pleasure to be the chair of the steering group for the Back from the Brink programme and to launch our first session for today. Yesterday we celebrated people's engagement and connection and learnt the lessons from the work that we've done over the, the previous years. And today we start looking at innovations in working for species recovery. This first session sets the scene for our work as a collaborative partnership between Rethink Nature and Natural England. And we'll kick off with Rich Howarth, the project manager, um, with his reflections um, over the overall picture, and then move to Dan Hoare from Butterfly Conservation, who will give, his, give us the benefit of his thinking about how we work together in an integrated way for multiple species. And then we'll have time for a QA. and a um, Just a bit of housekeeping around the Q&A session. If you have any technical difficulties during the session, please click on the orange icon on the top bar. Don't use chat, but use that orange icon and someone will come back to you um, to uh, address the issue that you might have. So you'll get some support. Um, you will have noticed on this platform, you can't turn on your camera or microphone when watching talks. Um, so use your chat function to share any feedback um, and any questions. So we'd really like you to do that. And for the Q&A at the end, um, we'll gather your questions together um, and start to work through those with Dan and Rich. So um, without more ado, um, I'll hand over to Rich and um, we'll go from there. Over to you, Rich. Everybody. My name is Rich Howarth. I'm the Back from the Brink Programme Manager. I work for Natural England and I put together the programme for today and giving this presentation to you now. All about species recovery across the Back from the Brink programme and talking about the actors, actions and achievements. So who's been involved, what we've done and what we've achieved so far. So I'll start off just by crediting our very generous funders, starting the National Lottery Heritage Fund who put in the majority of the funding, as well as other bodies like Esme Fairburn and People's Postcode Lottery and all the other fine organisations you can see on the screen there. And uh, we've had the privilege of working with some wonderful partners, so Natural England's the lead partner, working with Rethink Nature, which is the seven species conservation charities that are involved in Back from the Brink, and many others besides have been involved in this. And you'll be hearing from our NGO partners through the course of today and tomorrow as well about their species recovery projects. So just to give you an overview of the whole programme, some of you may have heard this yesterday from James, but I'll, I'll run through this. So four main objectives across the programme. Firstly, is a, a new way of working together, these eight partner organisations, gathering their expertise together and pushing forward new ways of working for species conservation. Secondly, and what yesterday was all about, is inspiring a nation, including our original target of 1.3 million people, being inspired to discover, value and act, and you've heard a lot about that, those that were present yesterday, and we've reached, we think, many more people than that. Thirdly, and what we are talking about today, is transforming the fortunes of wildlife, and I'll talk a bit more about how we've done that and the categories of what we've worked on um, in a following slide. And lastly, and where we're at now in our final year and final delivery phase of Back from the Brink, it's about creating a legacy of success. So restoring these threatened species to a steady state and engaging all the parties, our partners, landowners and communities to sustain them going forward. So to give you a, a bit of a picture of who, uh, well, what sort of organisations have been involved in Back from the Brink, we work with, we think, over 100 organisations across a whole diversity of areas, including conservation bodies, specialists in ecology and other disciplines, statutory bodies such as Forestry England, for example, and local authorities in our landscape project areas, uh, a whole wealth of private landowners and farmers to whom we're, we're indebted for, for the work that's being carried out and their participation and cooperation in it. 
Um, many, many volunteers, almost 4,000 individuals have been involved as volunteers and back from the brink, who've uh, carried out almost 9,000 days of work uh, in the programme so far. Uh, we've also worked with local community bodies, uh, people like parish councils, for example, and many individual members of the public as well. So to show you uh, a geographic picture of, of where we work, um, we've got a whole spread of projects across England, um, right from the southwest, from the tip of Cornwall up to, to, to the far end of the Scottish borders in Northumberland. Many of our projects are in the southern half of the country, which is where many of our threatened species that we're working on are found. And we've worked at over 150 sites across, across these project areas. Our projects, as you can see on the right hand side, we have 19 in total, led by different um, partner organisations. And there's two sorts of projects. Mostly what you'll be hearing about and from today is the integrated projects. So our seven projects that work in particular landscapes or particular habitats. And we also have 12 single species projects as well that have worked on their individual projects in different locations across the country. So to illustrate a little bit of what some of our species look like and, and the sort of things that we work on, and James gave quite an eloquent description of many of these yesterday, so I'll just run through these quite, quite briefly. Um, top left is the little whirlpool ramshorn snail, moving across to the checkered skipper butterfly, the willow tit, the ladybird spider, grey long-eared bat, the pearl wort, which is a liverwort, corn buttercup, uh, the rugged oil beetle, and that's the larva of it, that hitchhikes on solitary bees, uh, and last but not least, the shrill cardaby in the bottom right-hand corner. So we've broken down the species that we work on into two or three distinct groups, and our species we've taken largely from the Section 41 statutory list of the NERC Act in 2006. So that has a mm, just short of uh, 1,000 species on the NERC Act Section 41 list, uh, and we've taken about 20% of those uh, into the Back from the Print programme. And our categories for working on species, top of the list is 20 species that we're looking to safeguard from extinction in England. Things like the shrill cardaby that you just saw, as well as the, as the narrow-headed ant that you can see an image of in the top right there. And then other primary species, we have a further 92 prime, what we call primary species, that we're directly working on to improve their conservation prospects. So species like the sand lizard and the grey long-eared bat. And then we have a further category, another 112 threatened secondary species. So those are intended to benefit from the actions we're carrying out for our primary species, but we're not directly working for them. So things like the soil bunting and the licorice piercer moth that you can see an image of there. And we carry out a whole variety of different sorts of activity under Back from the Brink for species recovery. Uh, principle of which perhaps is species surveys of monitoring. We need to know where things are and we need to know how they're doing. So the image you can see there is a survey for pheasant sign, the arable plant in the margins there of the Colour in the Margins project. Uh, also really important has been our work on habitat management and habitat creation under the Back from the Brink programme, targeted at benefiting our primary species. Uh, we've also worked through many partners and third parties in order to provide them with technical advice and advice to landowners in particular to carry out the right sorts of management for the species going forward. Uh, and lastly, we've carried out a suite of different sorts of conservation interventions, perhaps notable of which is reintroductions of species like checkered skipper and translocations of species as we've done for a number of our arable plant species too. Um, so just before I get into the results of, of what we've done, just to give you a picture of how we're trying to measure our progress on species recovery. And this is quite a tricky field. Uh, and we've taken a few different techniques and approaches to try to do this. So the first of which, and the main one that we're using is using the species recovery curve and measuring the steps in progress along that theoretical curve. And you can see a diagram of that uh, on that graph there how species might respond with populations declining, us putting in measures place to uh, putting measures in place to, to address them and moving to a state where we can actually start to recover those populations. Um, so we've done that for our primary species. 
So it's really looking at stages in the process of recovering a species. And at the end of that curve, where you hope to get to is recovering and then recovered populations, and therefore improvements to conservation status as, as the ultimate outcome. So that's the first and the main measure that we've been using. We've also used a number of other methods. So we've taken the taxon group delivery actions, which are set at a national level, and we've looked at to what extent we can contribute towards those across both our primary and secondary species um, to, to, to benefit um, those species and to contribute to that national picture of activity. Thirdly, we're also recording things, uh, recording the sorts of activity we do within a, the Back from the Brink projects, things like the area of land managed for a particular species or suite of species. And that's really a proxy of the status, um, that sort of activity uh, measurement. And lastly, we have um, lots of um, descriptions, um, text descriptions of, of how species are doing and how they're changing as well, generated by our Back from the Brink projects. So uh, to firstly look at what we've achieved using the species recovery curve method. Um, and I should say many of these assessments date back now to February 2020 when we did a whole interim assessment exercise. They have been updated for those projects that have closed so far. So we have maybe six projects that have closed to date. Um, so we have so far benefited and moved species along the species recovery curve for 70 of our primary species including things like the Perbeck mason wasp that you can see in the image here. And for those species that have progressed so far, they, on average, they've progressed by about three species recovery curve steps along that, that, that curve. Uh, and when we did the exercise last year, we also looked to forecast back then where we thought we'd end up uh, by the end of the programme. The programme has subsequently been extended because of COVID last year into, into this year, into 2021. But back then we thought we'd achieve a further uh, one step of progress on average and we'd end up covering about 86 of our species with that species recovery curve progress. That was the forecast then, though those are provisional figures and they're ones that we will update come the end of the programme as our projects progressively close in the coming months. Um, and lastly, we've most of the progress has been made at the earlier stages of the species recovery curve, so typically steps one to six. And I will show you a graph of that just to sort of break this down a little bit more. So you can see in this graph on the left hand side is the, the number of species that we've got in the program. And along the bottom axis, the different species recovery curve steps one to nine. Um, and we've done, a, we've done a slightly more sophisticated um, analysis of species recovery curve. So rather than just saying it moved from say step three to step five, a particular species, we've actually looked at each of those steps and we've looked at the extent for each of those steps that we, we, we've achieved some progress. And you can see those in the, in the, in the colour bars through from red, which is no progress, through to dark green, which is full progress against those steps. So as you can see in this graph, there's largely been full progress made uh, in the first three steps, some of which may and will have predated back from the brink in terms of some of those fundamental aspects of understanding taxonomy, for example. Um, much of our work in Back from the Brink has really been around steps five to some extent, um, identifying um, the cause of decline, for example, and particularly six, trialling solutions and then adopting the best solutions into, into step seven. So that's where the most work is or was still to do really about adopting those best steps, deciding what they are, adopting, rolling them out, and then seeing those species recover and to, to, towards the final target. And clearly there is a lag time to achieve that as well. Uh, and then just taking the second approach that we have, looking at the national taxon group delivery actions. So this information is much more recent. We update this quarterly. So you have figures up to March 2021 for these. And for our primary species, we've delivered 200 or we've contributed to 297 positive actions for 103 of our primary species, so the vast majority there. And for our secondary species, we've contributed to 227 positive actions across 93 secondary species. So again, the, the, the great majority of species that we have on our lists. And just to show you a little bit more detail on that, this illustrates uh, or categorizes the extent against those actions to which we've delivered through from full de delivery to preparatory work. So much of our delivery 
has been of a partial nature, partial delivery towards the national targets, because we're not working across the whole nation um, and across the whole range of our target species in, in many cases. So I'd just like to conclude with a few key points that we take from, from our programme. So firstly, it's been a really successful programme, we think, over the four years and, and counting uh, that we've been operating. So most of our species have been improved in, in, in their status, and we expect to see some further progress than that right up until till the end of the programme, the end of this year. Um, but as I said, there is a lag time in species response to these conservation interventions. So therefore, we are going to be looking to forecast what their future prospects might be, looking at species recovery curve scores, say five years hence, uh, once the programme's finished, but benefiting from the measures that we've put in place over the last four years. Um, third point, conservation delivery for many of our species, 100 in fact, took place under a multi-tax approach, and you'll be hearing about that in the next talk. And as you can see, it is quite challenging to assess species recovery across these multiple species and species groups particularly at the outcomes end of things as well. And we've got some work going on that. Um, there's a need for ongoing collaborative conservation efforts, um, quite clearly going forward for the species. And we're putting in place legacy plans for our species, including recommendations for further work. And we have monitoring plans for each of our primary species as well, so that their progress can be tracked over time. And lastly, of course, and unsurprisingly, and unfortunately, there are many more threatened species out there. Obviously, the lists are changing all the time as well. So sort of section 41 or, or red list for IUCN um, still to be addressed. And one of the things uh, that we're doing is working closely with our, uh, our counterparts in Scotland and Wales. who have got their own sister projects now up and running uh, on species recovery, species on the edge. And that's what I'm with, who we're looking to pass the baton on and our lessons learned for them to carry on our good work. So thank you for listening uh, and please do submit any questions for the Q&A session at the end of this. Thank you. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Rich. Um, and just to uh, maybe provide a few reflections and to encourage um, folk to put their questions in. I can't see many questions at the moment, so please do uh, put comments in and questions. Um, and just a, a few things that struck me, which was around about um, this isn't just about rethink nature and natural England. The extent of the project has gone much wider um, to other organisations, to community groups and to volunteers. And, and that just astounds me. It's marvellous. And whilst um, there's a lot more to do than the fifth of the section 41 list which is what we've tackled it, it's still a fantastic start um, where we're trying to transform the future for those species and the final thing which strikes me is that we do have to find a way of showing success for species which is simple and can grab people's attention and I think that's a real challenge so um, they're just a few reflections from me. Um, I'm ready now, and I know Dan is, to kick off with Dan on our final talk. Over to you, Dan. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm Dan Hall, um, Director of Conservation at Butterfly Conservation. So I'm a partner in the steering group for Back from the Brink. Um, and it's brilliant to be able to talk to you today about some of the principal, one of the big principles at the heart of this project, which is multi-taxa species focused conservation. So as Rich has just outlined, Back from the Brink is all about that targeted action to recover the fortunes of threatened species. So one of the key innovations we've tried to test in this program has been how to collaborate better in that, to deliver that targeted action across multiple organisations simultaneously for multiple species across different taxa, whether they're bumblebees, birds, bats or beetles. So this is a species recovery approach that Rich has just outlined in the last talk, but it's really about doing it for many species in the same place at the same time. 
So uh, as Rich already showed, as part of that program, which included 12 single species recovery projects, we developed seven integrated projects where partners work to deliver multi taxa benefits. Um, that's numbers one to seven on this map, you can see, but really you're just looking at um, some of the larger blobs and just to show that there's a, a spread of work from the south of England up to the north. Um, that includes work in discrete landscapes like the Brex on the Suffolk and Norfolk border through our Shifting Sands project. So that's a suite of species that rely on bare ground and short grazed turf or something like Ancients of the Future where work took place across sites all across England um, looking at the value of veteran trees for bats, lower plants and deadwood invertebrates. And you'll hopefully hear about some of these in detail later in the programme today and tomorrow. So I'm going to talk about some of the common approaches from this really large and varied programme and try and share contributions from right across the team. So what I'm talking about are, are um, examples that have been given um, by the team really delivering us on the ground and talking about the benefits and the challenges of this kind of approach. So the first thing is it's really important to understand that this is not generic habitat management in which you hope to get some species responses. Um, as Rich outlined, it's a program of targeted systematic work to really move species along the recovery curve to improve the status of multiple species, perhaps nine or ten primary target species in each of these projects, and to do that at a landscape scale. So this slide just shows some of the key things about this approach, um, with the first one that it really requires a lot of planning. Um, uh, fall back from the brink, there was a development phase which was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, but only after quite a significant pre-development phase, a lot of the planning, partnership building, deciding on species and landscapes that went in in the early stages. That's really critical, it's really time consuming, it takes a lot of capacity from the partners. You need to make decisions about where to work, what habitats and species to work on, and that involves not only looking at which species are most in need, or can make the most progress, but also the capacity of the partners, um, both the key, the, the kind of core eight partners um, who delivered back from the brink, but also local partners, you know, landowners, uh, local partnership organisations in a landscape in which you wish to work. And of course, the communities that are there as well. Um, so whether local communities, which might include land managers and volunteers, whether they want to get involved, whether they agree with those objectives and whether they are able um, to engage in the process. But if you can build that strong partnership, then there are really brilliant opportunities to make an impact on species, to make a big difference for people, um, and to develop new ways of working for the conservation sector as a whole, which is some of the insights we're trying to share in this innovations conference. So what does it mean in, in practice to work in that kind of partnership? So um, for each of these integrated projects, project officers were employed to deliver these integrated projects and they were employed and hosted by one of the partners, but they were branded as back from the brink. So in our Roots of Rockingham project in Northamptonshire, which there's a map up here, a conservation officer and an engagement officer have been employed and hosted by Butterfly Conservation. But outwardly, they're presented to landowners, volunteers and partners as back from the brink staff. And that's really important, that shared identity um, so that they're contributing to the wider programme, but that um, people who are our main audiences are perceiving this as a back from the brink collaborative approach, not a butterfly conservation or single species partner approach. Um, what this does is provide a single point of species expertise delivering multi-species objectives for that landscape. Um, but it really also challenges those hosting partners to properly embrace the multi-species approach. So in Rockingham Forest, butterfly conservation, whose business is improving the fortunes of butterflies and moths, has to really get to grips with um, how to incorporate species advice and responses and monitoring for plants and for bats and for birds and for other taxa. Um, so it's really been a challenge both for everyone involved in the project and for the organisations delivering it. In Roots of Rockingham, the focus was woodland species, primarily those dependent upon open space habitats, from checkered skipper butterflies through to fly orchids, from adders through to barbastel bats. 
So to be able to deliver that range of species outcomes, you really need specialist support from across the partnership. So we built that into the project from the start. That included funded staff time for partners from other um, for staff from other partners, specific contracts to bring in expertise. Um, so that might be um, amphibian and reptile conservation helping with adders, plant life helping with botanical monitoring and targets. So a partnership at this scale presents loads of opportunities to learn from each other. So to test ideas in one landscape and see what works and then take that elsewhere. So it's really it's been a really important feature of this project that as well as delivering on the ground in a given landscape like Rockingham Forest, um, our project staff and our partner organisations have been able to learn from each other and see what's happening in all the different landscapes. And that's been really one of the biggest opportunities for us. Now that approach brings big opportunities for the organisations involved um, to have more impact. Um, and it's really critical that you know, really the, the main outcome here is about improving the fortunes of species, but in also improving the ability of local communities and land landowners to really get actively engaged in species conservation. So we can share our experience and insight of practical conservation, decades of experience from across sharing resources. So staff have collaborated on science, on engagement work, in practical management, borrowing equipment, um, and really bringing everything we have, all our joint resources to bear on this. Uh, for covering species. Really crucially, it's great for the audiences we're trying to engage with in this work. So volunteers who might already be involved in wildlife recording for one group, like birds or butterflies, some of those well-monitored groups, they can increase their knowledge of beetles or plants. Um, and here we've got uh, a natural history society in Rockingham Forest who got really engaged in all aspects of the project. And as that project, as that first funded phase of the project comes to an end, they are better equipped to carry on monitoring the natural history of that area and to provide um, species responses but also um, insights and advice to landowners and partners who are still active in the area. Um, we've also got botanical recording for rare plants in the Brex in this bottom photo. Crucially it's also what land managers want. So when you speak to a land manager about how to incorporate the needs of a rare species in their um, land management objectives, they really need coordinated advice about how to manage their land for a range of species instead of them having to juggle different, often conflicting advice from several different species interest groups. And of course, we also got really positive responses from local communities, as you may have seen in yesterday's presentations on engagement. So most people, if they're out for a guided walk to look for butterflies, they're delighted to be able to find out whether the bird singing in the bush next to them is a black cat or a nightingale, and to understand how the needs of all these different species fit together and are driving the habitat management that they see. Of course, it's also appealing to those who in the, underpin our conservation work through their support, whether that's large bodies or the members and supporters of individual charities. They want to see us uniting and collaborating to get better impact for species. So let's have a look at some of those examples of the benefits of this for species, the win-wins. So by focusing quite a lot of our management interventions on species with similar habitat needs, such as those using early successional open habitats, habitats on heathland or grassland or dune slack, you can get what you might call predictable shared benefits. So in Rockingham Forest, creating open rides and glades also brings benefits for grizzled skippers and woodwhites, other butterflies using the same habitat. And there's a whole suite of examples of that from across. But it's actually the, the unexpected outcomes that can be really the most interesting. So in Purbeck, in our Dorset's Heathlands Heart project, creating dry sandy scrapes is really good for a suite of invertebrates like sand wasps and heath potter wasps. But we also found that scrapes created for this fantastic Purbeck mason wasp in the pit were also used for nesting by sand lizards and that clearing gorse to create habitat for pale violet for example provides new territory for woodlark. So by having all of those species as targets monitoring their responses and providing feedback to landowners we can really demonstrate 
the kind of the sort of predictable uh, win-win benefits, but also some of those unpredictable outcomes from managing landscapes at a large scale and providing mosaic habitats. Critically, having those multiple species objectives built into the project allows us and encourages us to monitor and record those outcomes so we can learn from them. And of course, we can also use species to test and inform kind of broader conservation approaches. Um, they might be focused on restoring natural processes. Uh, that's an increasing focus of in the conservation sector. Um, in our project in the Brex, encouraging more resilient rabbit populations is a key focus as a way of trying to um, be more sustainable in maintaining the open grazed conditions needed by many of the threatened species there. So we can start to really measure the impacts, both positive and negative, of species to that approach. And that gives us more confidence about the likely results of those broad process-led conservation initiatives, right through from rewilding to those that focus on um, management-led habitat objectives, which many of the partners are involved in in other areas. So by, by really testing and marking our homework, it gives us more confidence when we take forward broader conservation initiatives as well. But we all set out, we, we really set out to honestly examine some of the potential conflicts between the advice we might give for one species and another as well. In the Cotswolds Living Legacies project looked at an assembly of species actions around the restoration of limestone grassland. The needs of some of these are quite complementary, such as the Duke of Burgundy butterfly illustrated here, um, with fly orchid and adder all of which like the rougher, longer, scrubbier end of the grassland spectrum. It can be harder to reconcile that with species that need much shorter turf, tighter grazing like large blue and juniper, which needs bare ground to see into. So the solution, of course, is to plan and prioritise at a landscape scale. Um, but if it likes three centimetre turf and 15 centimetre swords, Trying to go for a compromise solution of 10 centimetres doesn't suit either of them. So actually we find that prioritisation, looking at which sites are most important for which species, and really scale that provides room for everything, um, that's the solution really, rather than trying to compromise and not doing something that suits either species. So in this case, um, with grazing, using a system of paddock grazing with most is, has actually allowed us to ensure that all of these species can thrive side by side on the same site. And through this project, Dutch Blues and Duke of Burgundy are now flying together on the same sites for the first time in 40 years. We can take the sites from a site like that and apply them much more widely, not just across grasslands in the Cotswolds, but across limestone grasslands all over the UK. And one of the other kind of unexpected aspects, I suppose, is that loads of surveying for different species over extended periods throughout the year, that's not without it. Yeah. So our Colour in the Margins project on species of arable margins found that management for stone curlew can be perfect for the rare arable plant pheasant's eye. But stone curlews are easily disturbed during the breeding season, which limits the access you can get in to actually monitor those plants. Trying to understand how um, how to navigate those conflicts is a really crucial insight and you'll see lots more of that throughout the there can also be some technical gaps um, particularly for less well studied species or species where the data isn't so great at the start so there can be a temptation to focus on the easy groups where we will know a lot um, which leaves many invertebrates and lower plants for example underserved in a lot of conservation projects so we have to invest in those technical skills understand the limitations of the data understand that volunteers may find it harder to get engaged and help you monitor those species but with effort you can get some really big wins so for here in in the limestones living legacies project a really understudied species the rugged oil beetle which james eloquently described yesterday as a walking olive that fantastic little species was really misunderstood and under surveyed through this project we've really um, radically changed our ideas of which sites it's on um, and which habitats it's using on those sites. So it's put us in a much better position for a species that was technically quite hard to, to understand before. 
So over the four years we've been delivered to see lots of benefits of this broad approach. Hi everybody. Sadly, we seem to have lost Dan. We've got some technical problems and we'll try and get him back as soon as we can. Um, so meanwhile, we can start to take um, any questions. And I think because uh, we've got Rich with us and then we'll get Dan into the onto the main stage as soon as possible. So, um, Rich, are you going to join me on the stage? Lovely. That's great. Yeah, Thanks. Hi. Um, just going to the question that we've already got um, in the uh, chat, um, which is around there's some gaps that someone has seen in the northwest of England. Um, why, is, why is that the case? And have we got anything happening there at all and anything in the pipeline? Yeah, that's a very fair question. So we do have a bit of an outlier really in the northwest. Our Gems in the Dunes integrated project was working on the Sefton coast. So that, that was our, if you like, our Northwest representative, although our Pine Martin project was working both in Northumberland and Cumbria as well. So, so there was some representation, plus we have Willow Tip working in South Yorkshire too. But there is a, a sort of a, a heavy concentration, as you could see, of our projects in the South, and particularly the Southwest, really, because that's where our threatened species that we've selected are, are located. So that's obviously where the projects have to work. Uh, in terms of what happens going forward, there will continue to be work on the Sefton coast uh, with uh, amphibian and reptile conservation leading that. So there is a continued presence there and they have been looking for um, further funding, external funding in order to carry uh, new work and engaging people too. So, so there is some activity going forward in the Northwest, but, but yes, there is a concentration in the South. Um, plus of course, we'll have the, the Scotland project. Uh, well, that is, that is running for species on the edge. Yeah, that's lovely. Thanks, Rich. The, a few questions from me, really, um, that struck me from, from your, your talk, which was around, um, you know, we're moving species along the recovery curve, back from the brink, we'll finish come next February. Um, so how can we make sure that um, the longer term future for the species that we've been working on is secured? What are we putting in place? Yeah, well, that's absolutely vital. Obviously, the, the, the money's, you know, the, the big money is disappearing in terms of the lottery funding. So we've had almost seven million pounds we will have done of, uh, of cash spend uh, come the end of the programme. So we can't possibly replicate that. So it's really about transferring future work into as much as possible into business as usual activity by organisations. But clearly that still has a cost in terms of time and, and money and staff, resources, etc. So, so without that big chunk of external funding going forward, there won't be as much activity. So it's really about making what we have done sustainable in terms of the habitat improvements, for example, and in terms of, um, you know, keeping the volunteers engaged, keeping those species being monitored. We have species monitoring plans, as I said, in place for each of those primary species. And a good number of our organisations have committed to continuing to work on their target species from back from the brink in the future going forward as well, um, including, as I said, in the Sefton Coast, but other things perhaps like Cornish Path Moss, for example. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. And um, one of the questions that has come in from, from Howard was about have we been able to make recommendations to the um, Environment Land Management Scheme, which is going to be the replacement for um, stewardship as we go forward. And this is really sort of a question around legacy and building in the future of these species and what we've learned into other really important um, investment opportunities in species. Is there anything you want to say about that, Rich? Um, How so, influencing things? Yeah, so I mean, the, the subject of the next session is all about the farmland, actually, and the work we've done in farmland including working with agri-environment schemes and recommendations for species going forward for, for future agri-environment. Um, this is sort of a programme level challenge actually, where we're looking at how we make a difference sort of across the sector, drawing on different delivery mechanisms, things like Nature Recovery Network, for example, but also the ELM scheme too. So it is a work in progress, I think it's fair to say, and we will be having a further big final conference um, for some of the sort of decision makers, policy makers, et cetera, at the end of October to talk about these very things. So, so it's a work in progress currently to, to, to engage Thanks, with those. Rich. 
Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think Dan may have joined us. So, yeah, that's <laughs> great. Right. Lovely. Oh, sorry Thank about you. That. <laughs> that's all right. You went. Gremlins. And you're back. So it's so sorry that we didn't hear the end of your talk. I'm, I'm sure I think we will. Was... <laughs> okay. Um, one of the questions that you might be able to answer, Dan, from from Nicola is um, about how we can collate the experience and the observation um, of that sort of cross species delivery, multi species delivery for Section 41 species. But outside of back from the brink, you know, where else has this been happening? And it might be, you know, how would we collate that information? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it it happens experience it does happen but it happens around the edges because usually monitoring secondary species or other things aren't aren't the key focus and they're not funded um, and therefore they don't function when you get to the hard end of a project so you know butterfly conservation has has always been saying you know what's good for butterflies in an open woodland is likely to be good for a, a range of other species um, but we've never had the opportunity to test for for example do adders actually use these open areas that we've created for wood white butterflies, for example? Um, and it's always been a nice to do bit that's been bolted onto the end of a project. So, you know, the ch one of the key learnings for me from this is that is that we need to challenge ourselves and challenge some of the funders to to design and permit better multi taxa monitoring in future because actually i think there's a lot of sort of gray literature there's a lot of people saying well i think there are benefits for species x or y but there's just not that much outside of kind of pure um kind of academic uh, evidence bases which which are great but more limited um many of us spend our time just desperately trying to have as much impact as possible which means there's less time for doing the measurement so a really focused project like this like i said gives us more confidence that some of those multi tax benefits we've been claiming before are actually true in many cases yeah. Um, but yeah it's a really good question i think i think there is there's an opportunity that through um the partnerships that we forged outside the back from the brink program to really look at you know um, a call for information on that would be really interesting to then try and share more widely that's a good idea and um, one of the things that um, I wondered was about um, when it when would you actually uh, adopt a multi-species working approach and when would you choose to adopt a single species working approach obviously we've, we've adopted both but but you know, why, why would we do one and not the other? Yeah, that's a really good question. I was going to touch on that in my, in my final slides, but um, uh. that's a, it is a really good question. I think the what I would conclude from this program is that it can be really effective and, and brilliant, but it's not a quick fix. It's very time consuming. Um, it requires really deep commitment. So there may be opportunities where this can um, really add value shared resources um collaboration not competition those kind of things but there's there's going to be room for both you know conservation is going to need both approaches um kind of leaner projects that do a single species focus can still be really effective um so i think where where you've got suites of species that use the same um microhabitats for example like those early successional habitats i think there's loads of opportunity for similar collaborations like this in future um they may not all be at this scale they don't necessarily need to involve eight national partners it might be you just build into a project some monitoring for a second species um, or that you um, go in for a smaller collaboration with one or two key partners who can help you with another taxa that you're working on um, and I, yeah, I think you might get a blended model, but I wouldn't say that every, you know, um, all landscape scale conservation should aspire to be this approach because I think it can be very consuming and, and unwieldy unless you invest in it properly. And that sort of reflects your first few slides when you're talking about the huge amount of work that was input to the, even before we submitted 
for project support to develop the project, it, it really required a lot of input and a lot of thinking. So, yeah, okay. Um, Michael has asked about how much emphasis um, is going to be concentrated in the future on joining together successes for um, individual species. Um, I think he might, might be getting at um, connectivity across the landscape and where we might have single species focused projects joining together um, to start to sort of build up a, a network for them and for other species. And I, I don't know if you've got any reflections on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's what we all aspire to, really. You know, um, we want we want to save species in their own, but we want them to um, tell us something about about our environment, about whether we're succeeding or failing in broader land management and, and in nature recovery as a whole. So, you know, to me, um, species are you know the are the measure of successful nature recovery. Um, you can't tell whether you've really done it or not unless species unless some species are recovering and we want them both not just um, some very special threatened species but we want common species in abundance as well that's an important factor but when we talk you know Vanda you will know when we're talking about um, developing a nature recovery network for England the, the lessons we've learned through back from the brink are, are central to that discussion with natural England and other partners about how you can use species to really measure success so if we take an example like putting checkered skippers back into the rock in the forest you know, it's great that we're reintroducing a species lost to England okay. that's great in its own right but really for me what what that shows if that works that will show that um, the open habitats have been across that whole Rockingham Forest landscape and they're now much those open habitats are now better connected and on a more sustainable management cycle than they were when it went extinct in the 1970s so it's really about the icing on the cake to, to really demonstrate effective um, landscape scale habitat recovery um, so to me species aren't um, aren't something that that sort of is bolted on the side it's two sides of the same thing it's kind of the yin and yang of habitats and species together make species recovery and make it real yeah that's great thank you um emma has asked um about um or what she says is that many land managers are already doing multi-species work um and balancing species needs in particular places um and she said that perhaps is there a way of um, broadening that to others by uh, providing some questions um, so that we can, if, if we've got a series of questions, it can encourage others to think about species. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think we shouldn't, um, Emma's right, we shouldn't misrepresent things and say this is this is the only time it's ever been done. You know, every landowner you meet species all the time. What's new about this is that we've tried to to put the commitment behind it to give that single one-stop advice to really to really adapt our ways of working to fit what they need. Um, and I think that yeah trying to find um, trying to get more efficient about sharing that advice about um, identifying um, and identifying the win-wins that are easy for landowners but also sharing those conflicts and then providing solutions to potential conflicts so you know if you're a woodland manager providing better advice about how you can incorporate um, adder habitats and rare plant habitats alongside a, a productive woodland management cycle for example if that's what you're doing um, we need to get we need to get smarter about providing that in a way that that land managers are able to digest yeah I think um, you know, work, working for Natural England we, we always face that challenge from from land managers of we want one set of advice that's integrated, no conflicts, and we don't want three of you walking up the, the path to tell us all different things. So it's a real, I think it's a challenge for all of us because you know, the job is much bigger than just one organisation providing that advice. Um, we don't seem to have many other questions coming in, um, but that doesn't mean to say, that doesn't stop you from, um, uh, putting questions in the chat as we go along. Ah, oh, there's something from Howard here. Um, 
about do you have any links with universities for scientific analysis to interrogate different approaches maybe looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of multi-species working or success measures um, have we worked with or do we know if we're working um, in other places with universities maybe Dan this is something for you yeah it's really interesting and I think this is part of that that conversation about a sort of holistic conservation what we need to do what all the players to do if we're going to be successful in nature recovery um and the, the fact that some of this stuff gets really siloed so uh funders won't fund anything that has the r word for research in it um so explicitly within this project there was not you know in developing this project we could not put scientific research into this project um because that's not where the funder wants to put its support and that's fine but what we have done in some cases is bolt on um complementary work so for checkered skipper for example from the back from the brink program strand but complementary there are actually two um collaborative phds running examining both the habitat benefits for other taxa um in rockingham forest but also um looking at the wider issues of um climate resilience and suitability where those where that butterfly comes from in belgium where the source stock has been taken and really looking at all of those variables to try and you know um climate proof it you might say there's no point putting a species like that back unless it's going to be resilient and be able to adapt in future um but very often those collaborations have to happen around the side so again they are they're extra um extra requirements extra capacity issue or conservation organizations to think about but i think there's i think there's really room for um you know there's room for government support in that there's room for you know natural england to have that role as the kind of the hub who bring people together to, for those shared learning uh, and again access to different funds that aren't necessarily um uh, quite so limited so i think that there is a role for all of us to collaborate together to answer that question <laughs> 